It is really a pleasure for me to be able to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Catherine Pearson, today for this Constitution Day lecture. Uh, so Professor Pearson is a professor at the University of, uh, I was Wisconsin, right? Minnesota. Um, Okay, double check. I messed this up yesterday. Um, where she has written extensively on the US Congress, on congressional elections, political parties, uh, and women in politics. And the, one of the many things I appreciate about Professor Pearson's work is um, how sort of deeply she understands the legislatures that she's looking at, but also how broadly her work has been in sort of examining different facets of uh, legislative politics, as, as we're going to see today. Uh, she's the author of a number of journals in really outstanding outlets, uh, journal articles and outstanding outlets, uh, as well as a 2015 book uh, titled Party Discipline in the House of Representatives that I recommend to you very strongly. And read closely. Um, that book was based on her dissertation, which won the Carl Albert Prize for the best dissertation in legislative politics. So she's been putting out the great work from, from day one. Uh, she's working on a new project uh, that I'm really excited about, and I, I'm guessing we're going to hear a little bit about today, uh, Gendered Partisanship in the United States House of Representatives. Um, I also lastly, because I promised her, want to point out that um, uh, Professor Pearson came to political science having spent five years on the Hill, where very importantly, she worked with members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, it worked for them on both sides of the aisle. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pearson. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for that warm introduction, and thank you all for having me on Constitution Day. So happy Constitution Day. Um, but uh, as promised, I'm going to talk about Congress in the Trump era, gender dynamics and partisan politics, and not so much the Constitution. But I figure Congress is the first branch, um, so we're good to go. And I'm uh, delighted to be here with you. And I'll be speaking for a while, but I'll be sure to leave plenty of time for Q&A. If you have a burning question as I go, feel free to ask, but otherwise we'll save questions until the end. Uh, the United States Congress has changed in some pretty significant ways over the past 30 years. There's been a dramatic increase in partisan polarization and partisan competition, and a dramatic increase in the number of women elected to the House and Senate. Scholars have devoted considerable attention to both of these phenomenon, but usually in isolation. And so in my research, I try to bring these trends together and see what the important connections are between them. I was inspired by the disconnect between the study of Congress and the study of women in politics and my own observations, as Professor Walbrecht mentioned, mentioning working for two different Congress women on both sides of the aisle in the 1990s. I've done research on party discipline, and as I interviewed former party leaders, they themselves would volunteer gender differences and party loyalty, which is what I'll get to later in the talk. And so my research really speaks to the need for a broader understanding of the far-reaching effects of congressional polarization in the contemporary era. When we think sort of broad brush about gender and politics, it's a historic time for women in politics. The Me Too movement has prompted a lot of important conversations and awareness. A record number of women ran for Congress in won seats in 2018. Speaker Nancy Pelosi reclaimed the speaker's gavel in 2019, and a record number of women are running for president in 2019. But these firsts really obscure women's persistent underrepresentation, the diversity of women running and serving, and related challenges inside of Congress. And so that's really what I'll focus on today. If we take a uh, a look at the past 30 years, the number of women in Congress has more than tripled. Yet still, women comprise only 23% of the House today in 2019 and 25% of the Senate. This increase in the number of women in a male-dominated institution has raised questions about the effects of electing women and the gender dynamics inside of Congress, and with every election, has provided scholars with more women to analyze. But as you can see, the divergence between red and blue on this chart, since the 1990s, the growth in women's candidacies and in women in Congress has been concentrated among Democrats with some important implications. Of the 102 women serving in the House today, 89 of them are Democrats and only 13 are Republicans. So take one last look at this figure. You can see that this dramatic increase looks pretty great, women in Congress, until it's to scale. So this represents the increase of Republicans and Democrats uh, in office, women in Congress, 
if the scale goes to 435 and the underrepresentation is a bit more glaring. So this figure done to scale illustrates women's underrepresentation. And you should know that the US ranks 78th worldwide in its percentage of women in national parliaments. And so uh, by those standards, the US really is not doing very well. Before I dive into gender and partisan dynamics inside of Congress, I want to spend a bit of time talking about the path to Congress, because it's really important to understand women's representation when you think about constituencies and the representational imperative. So the first thing that I always tell my students that really surprises them is when women run for Congress, women win at the same rate as men. That's not to say that there aren't good women and good men who lose, there are, but the rate of women winning is the same as men. So in other words, uh, the percentage of women who run and win is the same percentage of men. So what this tells us is that not very many women are running in the first place. There was a time when people knew these general election results, which are pretty consistent in every election, and are also consistent, by the way, in state legislative races, when people wondered, well, is something going on in primaries? Are women being weeded out in primaries? Are women more likely to lose in primaries? And the answer is no. And not only is the answer no, Democratic women are actually more likely to win primaries than Democratic men, all else equal. And for Republican women, there's no statistically significant significant difference, although in, in uh, experimental studies, Republican voters are actually less likely to indicate that they would vote for a Republican women. In surveys of women and men in the so-called candidate pool, men and women who hold positions as attorneys, in small business, as educators, and political activists, women and men with the same qualifications don't view those qualifications in the same way. In fact, men are more likely to say that they're qualified to run for office uh, than women with the same qualifications, and then are more likely to do so. So it's not surprising that since 1982, the women who have run for Congress have been more likely to have previous electoral experience than the men who have run for Congress. Um, but women of both parties are more likely to run than men are in Democratic-leaning districts. So this helps Democratic women. It hurts Republican women. And much to everyone's surprise, again, if you look at campaign fundraising, Democratic women candidates actually outraise Democratic male candidates. And among Republicans, there's no statistically significant difference. So for the most part, these results of elections through 2016 suggest that the women who do run for Congress are more experienced, strategic, uh, prepared, and work harder to raise money um, to achieve these gender neutral results. Well, Flash forward to 2018, when all 435 House seats are open and 35 of 100 U.S. Senate seats are open. Well, Democrats needed to win 23 seats to gain majority party control in 2018, um, and they actually flipped 40 seats uh, with 60 new Democratic members. Republicans, on the other hand, in the Senate gained two new seats uh, for, for a change from unified Republican control to divided party control in the current Congress. All of this becomes relevant as I talk about the current gender and partisan dynamics. It's important to note that under any circumstances, it was going to be a good year for Democratic candidates. The out party is typically advantaged in a midterm election cycle. In midterm since 1862, the president's party has averaged losses of about 32 seats in the House. And in only three elections in the last century has the president's party actually gained seats in the House. That was in 1934, 1998, and in 2002. So it was pretty clear under any circumstances, that 2018 was going to be a good election for Democrats. But it was a particularly good election for Democrats for a couple of reasons. One is that President Trump was very unpopular among Democrats and very unpopular early on. And so that motivated a lot of candidates to declare early, earlier than in most cycle, and in particular, women candidates. So while a record number of Democrats ran in 2018, a high re a record number of women in particular ran. So not only did a record number of Democratic candidates run, but the percentage of women was greater than ever before. So 476 women ran for the U.S. House and 53 women ran for the U.S. Senate. 
And women won their primaries at higher rates than men uh, among Democrats. But once again, there was a partisan gap in women's candidacies. Women comprised 43%, a high watermark, of Democrats' nominees for the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, while as women, whereas women were only 13% of Republicans' nominees for the House and 22% for the U.S. Senate. That 22% among Republican women for the Senate was a record, but the 13% of women among Republicans was not. Women Republicans set their own record in 2010, um, which was a much better year for Republican. At the, in the same election cycle, 67% of women running for the state legislature uh, were Democrats. So this partisan gap was very clear in 2018, fueled in part because midterm elections are typically good for the out party, but in particular, many women were motivated to run over anger at the 2016 elections. This led to a record number of women on the ballot in November, in November 2018 uh, for House, Senate, and uh, gubernatorial contests across the country. In addition, women, were, women of color were one-third of all the House candidates, setting another record, and another record was set when 33 women actually challenged other women uh, for, in races that were guaranteed uh, to elect women. Whoops, okay. So all this meant that a record number of women now serve in the 116th Congress. 36 new women were elected for a total of 102, 35 Democrats and one new Republican, meaning that in the current Congress, as I said earlier, there are 13 Republicans and 89 Democrats. There are also a record 43 women of color. 25 women now serve in the U.S. Senate, 8 Republicans and 17 Democrats, including 4 women of color. So earlier I started by talking about research that shows that men and women win at the same rate. Well, in 2018, non-incumbent Democratic women actually won at a higher rate than non-incumbent Democratic men. So a little over a quarter of non-incumbent Democratic women won, which was quite striking, especially compared to only 3% of non-incumbent Republican women. And in fact, nearly 6 in 10 of the non-incumbent Democrats who did win were women. And just as it has in every other cycle, electoral experience was still key to many women's victory, but the experience for some women in the military, as community organizers, and in other professions was also important. The majority of Republicans elected to the House in 2018 were white men, but in the Senate, both of the non-incumbent Democratic winners were women. So clearly 2018 was a good year for women. And that helped propel Democratic gains. So this, New York, this uh, graphic from the New York Times, I think, is particularly interesting in that it shows where Democrats and Republicans, uh, the type of districts that they represent, and where the flips occurred. It's a little bit hard to read, but it goes from left to right and shows all the rural districts, uh, rural suburban, sparse suburban, dense suburban, urban suburban, and urban districts across the country. And the bright red and bright blue indicate the districts that flipped, either from Democrat to Republican or Republican to Democrat. And a disproportionate amount, uh, number of those districts that flipped from Democratic to Republican, those 40 seats, were actually flipped by Democratic candidates, Democratic women. And those women tend to be much more moderate than sort of the current uh, portrayal would suggest. Uh, just quickly on voters. We often think that you know, gender is an important predictor of vote, but party identification is actually the most important predictor of the vote. But there is a gender gap uh, in the sense that women are more likely to support Democratic candidates. Not necessarily women, but in 2018, Democratic candidates were disproportionately uh, likely to be women compared to Republicans. And so if you look at data collected by the Co Cooperative Congressional Election Studies on the congressional vote uh, from 2008 to 2018, um, plotting the Democratic share of the two-party vote, where 50% is sort of equal share to Democrats and Republicans, you can see that the only consistent group to vote for Democrats are college-educated white women. Um, some of the other groups uh, fluctuate, but non-college women and uh, non-college men are consistently unlikely to vote for Democratic candidates. So party ID is the biggest factor, but gender matters in vote choice as well in, in significant ways, particularly with the uptick in 2018.
This graphic is also from the New York Times, and it shows sort of in red and blue, the gender divide from 1982 to 2018. And this plots women on the left and men on the right, and the curvy lines indicate their votes for a Democrat, Democratic or Republican congressional candidate in the elections from 82 to 2018. So you can see that in all but one election, women have trended more toward the Democratic candidate, and men have trended uh, more toward the Republican Republican candidate with, again, a couple exceptions. So um, in 2010, Republicans won the female vote. Um, and you can look at some of the, the other elections where the gender divide mirrors the national swing. But one of the things that is remarkable about this figure is it shows uh, that both groups, men and women, went toward the Democratic Party in 2018, but nonetheless, uh, men still were more likely to vote for the Republican candidates. But the real reason I put this up is to show the significance of the following figure, and that is that women are not a monolithic group. So this graphic also from the New York Times in the same data series looking at uh, vote choice from 1982 to 2018 in for House candidates shows that black women and uh, Latinas are really critical to uh, this gender gap that we talk about in the electorate. That if you just look at the votes of white women, white women are still more likely to vote for the Republican candidates um, than uh, the Democratic candidates, which has important implications for representation inside Congress. In 2018, the last uh, point on this figure, you can see that white women are nearly divided in their votes between the Republican and Democratic candidates, um, but in many of these cycles, white women were less likely than white men, but more likely than not to support the Republican candidates. And that this gender gap in the electorate, whereby women are more likely to support Democratic candidates, is fueled by women of color and white women with college degrees, sort of representing the current Democratic coalition. So that gets us to our first-term Democrats and first-term Republicans. Um, and the Democratic group is obviously larger, um, and it is the most diverse freshman class ever, um, and in part because of the Democratic women. And this Congress also marks the first time that more than 20 African-American women serve at the same time. So if you just read media accounts, uh, one of the most notable um, features of this election is the election of the squad, uh, a name that they gave themselves for new congresswomen, representatives Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York, Rashida Tlaib of Michigan, and Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts. They named themselves the squad, and they have been quite effective in garnering a lot of attention on social media, a lot of followers. AOC, as we all know her, has a record, you know, breaking number of Twitter, Twitter followers, but they have also been the focus of intense scrutiny, both from the president and from Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Um, in their drive to move the Democratic Party leftward, um, Speaker Pelosi has clashed with them. They ultimately supported her bid for the speakership, um, but they voted against the party line on a border funding bill back in June, and Speaker Pelosi vented in an interview with Maureen Dowd, which of course wound up uh, in the newspapers, um, quote, all these people have their public whatever in their Twitter world, but they didn't have, but they didn't have any following. They're four people, and that's how many votes they got. Well, they, they sort of beg to differ, um, and they've attracted a lot of attention. And it seemed that this feud between Speaker Pelosi and these new women of color who've garnered a lot of attention, who want to move uh, the party to the left, was potentially going um, to really blow up for Pelosi until um, President Trump jumped in the fray um, and said that, that the squad should go back to other countries, all U.S. citizens, fueling outrage among all Democrats and really unifying, um, unifying the party. And so it's important to think back to the graphics I showed earlier, that the Democratic Party right now has, is representing a lot of different groups. And for the four women of color in the squad and for many other of the Congresswomen, um, their bases are very liberal districts or districts that are comprised by a lot of voters of color where they talked about policies like Medicare for all or impeaching President Trump. And Speaker Pelosi, for her part, is worried about getting 218 votes to pass Democratic priorities. And so to an extent that Pelosi really didn't experience the last time she was 
speaker, the Democratic Party is really fragmented on just how far left it should be, whether or not to begin impeachment proceedings about President Trump. And uh, Speaker Pelosi is taking a lot of heat for that. But she's also very concerned about reelecting those members who flipped the 40 districts that uh, catapulted Democrats to the majority. Now, they needed 23, they got 40, um, but Pelosi wants to keep her majority, certainly, um, and if she can, keep that margin, uh, keep those margins. And so often overlooked in the media are a lot of other gender dynamics at work, where a lot of women are trying to get reelected in districts that went for Trump in 2016. Five of them are female military veterans, and so they founded the Service First Women's Victory Fund. Alyssa Slotkin of Michigan, Christy Houlihan of Pennsylvania, Abigail Spanberger of Virginia, Elaine Luria of Virginia, and Mickey Sherrill of New Jersey. They're all veterans of the CIA, the Navy, and the Air Force, and they have really formed together to sort of become a different voice for women within the Democratic Party. So as the Democratic majority, as the number of women in the Democratic majority gets larger, sort of the diversity of women becomes much more apparent. And so now I sort of want to pivot towards some of my research on gender dynamics inside of Congress. And I should note that this research was all conducted through the end of last Congress. So I have not been able to crunch the numbers on the current Congress, but I have some thoughts about how it both sort of fits in and then is an anomaly um, right now. But when I think about gender dynamics inside of Congress, there's sort of two forces that are really important in explaining gender differences in legislative behavior. In other words, how women and men might legislate differently. And the first is the fact that serving in a male-dominated institution gives Congresswomen extra incentives to prove their credentials to their colleagues and their constituents. Research shows that Congresswomen are indeed more active and more effective. So for example, all else equal, if you control for seniority, committees, women introduce more bills than men. Women in Congress after Congress give more speeches on the House floor. They give more speeches during debates on important issues as, measures, as measured by Congressional Quarterly. And they give more speeches at the beginning of le the legislative day, which are called one-minute speeches. So they introduce more bills, they're more active. Other research has shown that women are more effective at bringing appropriations back to their district in the form of federal spending. And uh, that for women in the minority party, they're more legislatively effective throughout the process. A lot of scholarship on women in Congress has focused on gender differences in legislative style and substance. And that's not what I do in my research, but I think it's important to, uh, to recognize that research. And research on women historically has found that women are more likely to support women's issues or issues that disproportionately affect women, such as funding for breast cancer research and roll call voting, although today partisanship is the biggest predictor, bill sponsorship and co-sponsorship, um, but this is more true of Democratic women than Republican women. And in research I've done with a colleague, Logan Dancy, we have found that women on both sides of the aisle are more likely to bring women's interests to policy debates about a variety of issues in their speeches. And so we don't code debates or speeches for whether or not they focus on women's issues. We code speeches for whether or not women's interests are mentioned. So the speech could be about uh, a war or it could be about energy policy or whatever policy. We just code for whether or not the speech specifically mentions the interests uh, of women or girls. And we find that over the course of uh, a 12-year period, both Republican and Democratic congresswomen discuss women's interests significantly more, more often than congressmen of both parties do in every Congress. And so we feel that there really is evidence that women are bringing a woman's perspective to the debate whether or not it's about something that is coded as a women's issue. So I said there were sort of two important contextual factors in thinking about this. The first is women's underrepresentation and the incentives that drive women as a result to prove themselves to their constituents and colleagues. And the second is the fact that the current Congress and the last several Congress have been very polarized along partisan lines. So since the 1970s, partisan polarization has been increasing, um, but we're really seeing Two parties who behave as competitive teams, fighting for a slim majority. 
Parties are more internally like-minded, despite the divisions I just talked to you about, and distinct from one another. There are very few members who vote across party lines these days. I'll show you a figure on that in a minute. And as a result, members of Congress have been willing to give party leaders more power than they used to have. We used to have a Congress, probably the Congress that many of you learned about in high school, that scholars refer to as the textbook Congress, where a bill is introduced and committee chairs have all the power as to whether or not to move that bill forward, to serve as a gatekeeper, and really the key decisions are made in committees. That system is long gone, and party leaders make the decision about the agenda, majority party leaders, sometimes in consultation with committee chairs, sometimes not. So party leaders control the agenda and have much more power, and they not only use that power over the agenda, but they also have the power to reward loyalty with legislative opportunities, committee positions, uh, and that, and especially when they're pursuing a partisan policy agenda and they need to use party discipline to keep their members in line. And so this context is very important. Um, and just as gender matters, so does party strength and polarization. This figure from Congressional Quarterly Vote Studies shows the dramatic rise since the 1960s in party unity. And this figure shows the average percentage of a member's votes with his or her party and against the other party. Um, so Republicans reached a high uh, in the Senate of 97% voting with each other against the other party in 2017. Just to give you an example, and these averages used to hover way down in the 60s and 70s in earlier decades. So most members of Congress vote with their party, and if they don't, leaders get upset about it because typically the margins are pretty slim. So another point on parties being highly competitive. Well, Speaker Nancy Pelosi really embodies this party competition. Um, here she is at the State of the Union address um, with President Trump. You can sort of see on display the animosity between them, but they are the leaders of their two respective teams. Even as some Republican members may grumble privately, um, they really aren't publicly anymore. You know, the parties are two teams competing against one another for policy, for reputation, uh, for elections, um, and these are our leaders. And Speaker Pelosi was first elected as Speaker in January 2007, and she became the first female Speaker of the House, presiding over a chamber that was then 84% male. And she came into the Speakership in an, in an era of very, um, uh, in, an, in an era of powerful speakers. Speakers had gradually become more powerful since the mid-1970s. Newt Gingrich in 19, 1995 accelerated that in a very public way. Following Newt Gingrich was Speaker Hastert, who really even further consolidated the powers of the House Speaker in a less public way, but in a way that really gave him control over the agenda, over committee assignments, over committee transfers, um, in a way that previous speakers had not enjoyed for over 100 years. And so Pelosi inherited this and sort of seized the day and herself was a very powerful speaker um, and a speaker who was willing to discipline her members who didn't go along who didn't go along along um, Pelosi embodies many of the traits of these new speakers she is a strong partisan demonstrated by her support for liberal policy initiatives her fundraising prowess she consistently raises more money than any other elected official to, to dole out to her colleagues and candidates, her willingness to exclude the minority party from legislative decision making. She routinely would preside over closed rules where Republicans would have no opportunities to offer amendments, and by her relentless attacks on Republicans. You know, she was sort of constantly is up at the podium criticizing Republicans. And so Pelosi's leadership style is very much at odds with the consensus-oriented style described by many scholars of women in politics um, and as typical of female leaders. And so this really sort of raises questions about how gender operates in a highly polarized way. And so that brings me to a theory of gendered partisanship, which is Congresswomen's strategic response to increased partisanship in Congress. In a partisan environment, all members of Congress have strategic incentives to support their party. Congresswomen, though, have extra incentives, and their strategic responses are shaped by significant gender dynamics at work in the electorate and inside Congress, stereotypes about Congresswomen and their communal behavior, a legacy of bipartisan cooperation among Congresswomen, 
institutional and party rules, and differences in the type of districts where women run and win. So this theory of gender partisanship expects that women will respond to increased partisanship above and beyond their male colleagues. So I expect that gendered partisanship leads to sex differences in partisan behavior in both the House and the Senate, and that women's behavior in each chamber differs based on chamber-specific institutional rules and incentives. Women in the House should take extra steps to prove their partisan credentials, while women in the Senate will be much more likely to work across party lines. Widespread gender stereotypes suggest that women are more cooperative and less assertive than men. And in a partisan era where party leaders value sort of attacks on the other party and devalue bipartisan cooperation, women need to take extra steps to prove themselves. Today's Republican women also need to counter the stereotype that they are more liberal than their male counterparts, as was indeed the case among Republican Congresswomen in the 1990s. So Republican Congresswomen have even stronger incentives than Democratic Congresswomen do to support their party. Research on gender stereotypes shows that congresswomen are viewed as more liberal than congresswomen are, uh, regardless of their actual voting records. So what does this mean in practice? What is the evidence that women, on average, are more partisan than men in the same party? So my research uh, goes back to 1989, and I hypothesize that Congresswomen will show more party loyalty than Congresswomen, uh, excuse me, than Congressmen, with their roll call votes, their discharge petition signatures in the minority, and by not signing in the majority, I'll explain that in a minute, their partisan floor speeches and their fundraising for their same party colleagues in their party. So I collected a ton of data going back to 1987 or 1989 in some cases through the last Congress to test these hypotheses. Um, I also gathered data on the district demographics, the presidential vote in each district, member seniority, their institutional position, um, to get a handle on some of the other factors that might influence their partisan behavior. Um, I don't show a bunch of regression coefficients in this presentation, um, but I'll talk about them a little bit. And so the first thing I wanted to look at was party loyalty in voting. In other words, what percentage of the time uh, do women compared to men in the same party vote with their party and against the other party on key votes that divide the party? And this figure is uh, a little bit messy, um, but it basically shows, um, well, it shows a couple of things. And the first is that the trend among all four groups, Democratic women um, in the solid blue line, Republican women in the solid red line, Democratic men in the hashed blue line, and Republican men in the hashed red line, that all four groups are, are getting increasingly loyal so that there's less of a difference between these groups than there used to be. Um, but it does show a pretty pronounced flip among Republican women. If you look at the solid red line, you can see that back in the late 80s, early 90s, Republican women of the four groups were the least likely to support the party line. Um, but that gradually, Republican women's percentages, while still sort of jagging up and down, have crept up. Democratic women, on the other hand, have been pretty consistent supporters of the party when it comes to roll call votes in that solid blue line. Um, nonetheless, it's still ticking up. I did run multivariate, again, regression analysis, predicting party loyalty in voting, taking into account district characteristics, committee position, um, seniority, and other factors. And the results showed um, that by 1991, Democratic women indeed vote more frequently with their party than men, and that the gap widens over time. Um, from 1991 to, 200, to 2017, Democratic women are between two and nine points more loyal than Democratic men. Republican women lag behind Democratic women and Republican men in their loyalty from the 100th to the 108th Congress, but in the 100th, excuse me, 111th and 112th, Republican Congresswomen vote with their party more often than Congressmen. And the dramatic increase in Republican Congresswomen's loyalty uh, is caused both by new members entering Congress, new Republican women, and by the Republican women that we're currently serving becoming more loyal to the party.
for a much less obvious indicator of party loyalty, but nonetheless extremely important indicator to party leaders, I look at discharge petition signatures. Now I'll back up a minute. A discharge petition is something that is filed to discharge a bill or a rule from committee and automatically bring it to the House floor. It's a cumbersome process. It takes a couple weeks once uh, 218 signatures are gathered, but nonetheless, it is really the only way to overcome gatekeeping. If majority party leaders won't schedule a bill on the House floor, a discharge petition could extract a bill from committee or from the Rules Committee and put it on the House floor. But it needs 218 signatures. And so by definition, in order to get 218 signatures, some members of the majority party would have to sign on. And party leaders feel very strongly majority party leaders, that their members should not sign discharge petitions. Um, true story, in the 1990s, I worked for a member of Congress who signed, who was in the majority, who signed a discharge petition to extract campaign finance from committee and bring it to the House floor. And uh, the member of Congress got a very upset call from a party leader, and she decided to pass the phone to me. It was not a pleasant experience. Um, fortunately, at this point, I knew I was going to graduate school, but I can attest that party leaders are not happy when majority party members sign discharge petitions. On this is just federal. Um, you know, 50 states, 50 different rules. I can't say with certainty, but I haven't heard of any states who have done that. Um, that would be interesting. But um, so this, and again, it's a very cumbersome process. And usually what happens is that if it's getting close to 218, that'll put pressure on majority party leaders. But there have been a couple pieces of historic legislation that have gotten out this way. Um, and minority party leaders, of course, want their members to sign to increase the pressure on the majority party. Um, so uh, I looked at discharge petition signatures and found um, that once again, Democratic women were more likely than Democratic men, all else equal, to use discharge petition signatures as a tool to challenge Republicans. And Republican women, once again, have had sort of a consistent reversal. That in the 1990s, Republican women were less loyal than men. In other words, more likely to sign the petition in the majority or not sign it in the minority. But now, in the last several Congresses, Republican women have been more loyal than Republican men. Um, so again, a real reversal on this very inside baseball, but nonetheless, legislative behavior that's quite important to party leaders and their agenda control. One of my favorite parts of this study is an analysis of congressional speeches. So if you turn on C-SPAN, you know that members of Congress are giving speeches all the time. Um, but for this analysis, instead of looking at debate over key legislation, where I found that women were more likely to participate and more likely to invoke women's interests, I was interested in gender differences in behavior on what are called one-minute speeches. So if you ever turn on C-SPAN at the beginning of the legislative day, you'll see that uh, there are members lined up in the front of the chamber, and they're asked to be recognized for one minute. Um, and they can talk about anything. They can congratulate their constituents on a great win in football. Um, they can talk about an industry that's doing well. They can criticize the other party, which is what I'm most interested in. Or they can talk about how great their party is. Um, they really can do any number of things. Party leaders try to coordinate these speeches, but members can do whatever they want with these speeches. Um, and so, uh, a colleague and I looked at one minute speeches over a 14 year period looking specifically at attacks on the other party and speeches that praise one's own party. Um, and in fact, this behavior was so frequent that about 10 years ago, a bipartisan group of members tried to move them to the end of the legislative day because they started the legislative day with such partisan rancor. Not surprisingly, the leaders deposed it and they were not successful. Um, but none nonetheless, party leaders view these sort of one minute partisan speeches as another measure of loyalty. You know, you're boosting the party's fortunes or you're attacking the reputation of another party. So this is Marsha Blackburn, now a senator from Tennessee, but at the time uh, of the, for much of the analysis, a House member, and she in fact is the leading one-minute speaker um, on the House floor. And most of her speeches 
sound something like this. I will not read the whole speech, um, but this is sort of the length and content of a one-minute speech that an undergrad research assistant um, would have coded. And that is whether or not it has no partisan content. First, it was run through a content analysis program, defined all references to party. And then if it had references to party, uh, then it was coded for tone. Um, and you can see, among other things she says in this speech, my constituents are asking me, how high does the price of gasoline have to go before the Democrat leadership of this house decides to vote to allow domestic energy production? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's nearly 55% more than they were paying when Speaker Pelosi took over. The American people are wanting answers. And what is the energy solution that the Democratic leadership has offered? Well, it has been banning the traditional light bulb. Americans want answers, Mr. Speaker, but even more, they want some action. They want the problem solved. So this is coded as a speech that is critical of Democrats. This was a lot of coding. But um, we found some pretty striking results. And so the first results I'll show are partisan rhetoric on the floor comparing Democratic women and Democratic men. Um, and the blue lines in this case indicate speeches by Congress women, and the black lines indicate speeches by Congress men. And there are positive Democratic speeches uh, that are solid and negative Republican speeches, um, which are um, hashtags. And you can see the most striking part of this is just how frequently Democratic women are leading the way in those negative speeches criticizing Republicans. Um, and the entire time series sort of goes up and down a little bit. There's a big dip in the 107th Congress. This is the Congress that spanned the 2011 attacks. And so the partisanship varies from Congress to Congress, but in every Congress, Democratic women are pretty much um, leading the way. And uh, in a multivariate analysis, those results are confirmed um, to show just how much more uh, dramatic Democratic women's response are. are. If you look at uh, compare partisan rhetoric on the House floor among Republicans, once again, women are in red, men are in uh, the black lines. And Again, there's sort of a reversal here um, with Republican women really, by the end of the time series, leading the way. Now, I will say, without Marsha Blackburn, the results hold, although the spike is slightly less, pronou is less pronounced. Um, so she is driving a little bit of this. Um, but nonetheless, it is consistent even without her, even if less pronounced, and it, uh, these results sort of withhold multivariate specifications. Um, De Republican Congresswomen give, on average, four and a half speeches attacking Democrats and almost two speeches praising Republicans, while Congressmen only give 1.2 speeches attacking Democrats and 0.63 speeches in support of their party. Um, so Republican women, once again, really leading the way here, especially um, in the latter half of the time series. The final question um, that I looked to were the gender dynamics of participation in party fundraising. Party fundraising in the contemporary era is incredibly important. Both parties have had sort of embarrassing memos leaked where it makes clear that to be a committee chair, you need to raise, what, $100,000, subcommittee chair, $50,000. The, the amounts vary from Congress to Congress, but both parties, both party leaderships place a premium on fundraising for the party, and it's essentially sort of the price of participating at a high level in committee politics. But the politics of gender dynamics and fundraising have never really been that well understood. Um, for example, non-incumbent women running for office actually outraise their male counterparts, but yet, if you listen to any panel of women from both parties as elected officials, they will tell you that women raise less money than men even though the empirical evidence um, suggests otherwise. And that is really corroborated at some level by research that shows that women actually work harder to raise that money. They, they send out more solicitations, they do more to raise that money, but in fact are quite successful in doing so, with Nancy Pelosi being the biggest example. Um, so I set out to understand what how women and men compare on fundraising for the party, not fundraising for their own campaigns, but for fundraising for the party or what I refer to as their fundraising loyalty. Um, and in this particular specification, I have to say, there are not a lot of big gender differences. So once again, women are in blue, men are in black, and I've grouped it in in terms of three different types of contributions, contributions from leadership PACs, contributions directly to the party, and contributions to other members of the same party. And uh, in general, 
men and women are both doing a fair amount of fundraising. And I should say that Nancy Pelosi is included in these figures, and without her, the results do look slightly different. Um, sort of go both ways on whether or not to include her, but her fundraising presence is so important. Um, so basically, the sex differences here are pretty uneven. Um, the same is true among Republicans, with men actually having a slight advantage in some domains um, and less so in others. And so the fundraising loyalty results are not particularly interesting, except to say that the notion that women are raising less than men, I think this generally refutes among Democrats um, and, and challenges among Democrats and sort of muddies the water among Republicans. Before I say more about party leadership, I wanna talk about some research I have done on some of the implications of this increasing loyalty among women within their party and what it means for bipartisan cooperation. In 1977, the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues was founded by 15 Congresswomen. And back at this point, the gender imbalance between Republicans and Democrats was not so stark. In fact, if you looked at women as a percentage of the party's respective caucuses, um, the percentage was roughly equal until the 1992 elections, when a disproportionate number of candidates were, were uh, of women candidates were Democrats, and it's really never gone back since. Um, so the Women's Caucus was definitely founded on a bipartisan note um, and continued to operate as such really effectively until 1995. It was registered as a legislative service organization in 1981, which allowed Congresswomen to pool their resources, hire staff, have office space, and really develop a pretty robust organizational capacity and leadership, where staff and members would routinely meet, staff of the caucus would draft legislative items that were sponsored um, and pushed on a bipartisan level. But after the 1994 elections, all legislative service organizations were banned. And so that status of members being able to pool their money together to hire staff, have office space, print out newsletters, really gather information for uh, a robust policy agenda went by the wayside uh, for not just the Women's Caucus, but for all groups like this. Um, and there were groups on both sides of the aisle, but there were more groups like this that trended toward Democrats. And so it was seen as um, something that you know, Speaker Newt Gingrich did in order to defund some of the organizations like the Democratic Study Group that were particularly effective. Um, so it became a congressional member organization with sort of stated goals to remain effective. Um, and initially, it did. Um, it continued to have weekly meetings, have an organization, even without some of the infrastructure in place. But over time, it became quite challenging. And so I tried to assess the consequences of partisan politics on the Women's Caucus in a couple of different ways. And the first was with references to the Women's Caucus on the House floor during this time period, um, from 1987 to 2017. And I found, actually, in some ways to my surprise, that, 19, that the 105th Congress, or 1997-1998, uh, was one of the high watermarks. So even after the Women's Caucus had become a congressional member organization, that the women were still talking about it and really trying to forward an agenda. I replicated the study separating out symbolic and substantive mentions, um, and the results really didn't change that much. As you can see, there's a lot of symbolic mentions that don't actually pertain to legislative items that the caucus is working on, more sort of congratulatory um, remarks or sort of here's the problem but without a solution. Uh, but nonetheless, the bulk of the activity was still uh, in the late 1990s. But by the early 2000s and up to the present day, the Women's, Ca Women's Caucus references sort of disappeared from the House floor. Um, and so happily, um, I, so I was able to interview the head of the Women, Women's Policy Inc., um, which, or, uh, excuse me, the women, it used to be Women's Policy Inc., the Women's Congressional Policy Institute, which monitor some of these activities and could talk to me about sort of what was happening with the Women's Caucus, because they were still meeting. Um, but she told me, quote, we used to have an agenda, and slowly and, but surely it slipped away because it was more difficult to get bipartisan agreement on specific legislation. We moved to priorities instead, 
before Pelosi was Speaker. What was starting to happen was that there were laundry list agendas, and it was meaningless, throwing in every bill every member suggested, even if no one agreed with them. It wasn't effective. At some point, they decided that they would rather do priorities and not have, end quote, and, and not have legislation attached to them. And so, as you can see, uh, in the last 10 years of this time period, there were no specific Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues bills that Democrats and Republicans could agree on. And so they continue to meet, they continue to talk about policy issues which have a disproportionate impact on women, whether it's human trafficking, small business, women's health, but they don't take legislative positions and they tend to avoid issues that are policy priorities for either party because the women in both parties don't want to run afoul of their party leaders. I'm wrapping up very soon, but I want to conclude with a little bit more about Speaker Pelosi's leadership. So I started to talk about this earlier, but I think the historical record, at least considering her speakership uh, during President Bush and President Obama's terms, um, would suggest that she was one of the strongest speakers in history, judged by the party unity that she garnered among her members. When she became speaker in 2007, and certainly when she was re-elected speaker in 2009 during the first two years of the Obama administration, many scholars and journalists suggested that she was going to have a very difficult time keeping the Democratic caucus together. Because after all, the Democratic majorities were formed because so many Democrats won marginal seats, the seats that they lost in 2010. And so the blue dogs, or the more moderate to conservative Democrats, really were at their high watermark during Pelosi's first speakership. But even as she attacked Republicans, threw bombs to the other side, wouldn't let Republicans have any of their amendments, she was enormously effective at meeting with different groups of Democrats and smoothing out differences behind closed doors. And that allowed her to get enough members, exactly 218 Democrats, to support the Affordable Care Act and to push through many party priorities during the first two years of the Obama administration. Um, in 2019, it initially looked like Pelosi was going to have trouble becoming speaker again, I mean, really for many reasons, um, in part because she lost the majority in 2010, in part because it's several years later, um, and in part because, once again, moderate Democrats who don't want Pelosi in their ads running for re-election were going to be a challenge. But what I think surprised her, and initially many observers, is that moderate Democrats were not her only challenge. She also had many challenges from the left, and many of those challenges came from some of the new Democratic women of color that were recently elected and had a very high profile, such as Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, who ultimately agreed uh, to support her as Speaker. But in 2019, despite the fact that the Democratic Party is more liberal than it was when she was Speaker the first time, and so political science models of party leadership would suggest that this would give her more power than ever before, she is really struggling. And she is struggling in some of the same ways that Speaker Boehner struggled and Speaker Ryan struggled with the Freedom Caucus. And so despite the fact that conventionally political scientists have understood the most challenging sort of component of party party leaders um, uh, you know, needing to deal with members who won't support them as being from their centrist members, um, Pelosi is now facing some of the same dynamics that, uh, that Boehner and Ryan did from, um, their from, their, from the wings of their party. And so this shift really represents representational and institutional changes since 2010, along with divisions over how to challenge President Trump. So many of those Democrats who are sort of clamoring for impeachment proceedings to begin are some of the more liberal women elected, both in 2018, 2016. The leader of the Progressive Caucus, uh, Representative Jaya Paul, she's a leader um, in this as well. And so that's not to say that there aren't men involved as well, but Pelosi is really sort of dealing with very different challenges than she did a decade ago as Speaker. Um, and so it's, it will be interesting to continue to watch how she deals with those challenges, whether or not she, uh, whether or not Democrats maintain the majority, whether or not she is the next Speaker, um, and sort of how all of this unpacks. But I think, you know, one of the lessons um, for scholars is that, you know, we need to keep updating our theories with with new data and new understanding, and for scholars of women in politics, is is that with an increasing diversity um, of members, it's sort of always good to to challenge what we think we know.
Uh, now I'd love to take your questions. Sure. Uh, what, 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 I, yeah. Uh, did you mention Did you mention that Speaker Pelosi agreed to step down at some indefinite time? And was what time was it if she agreed to it? Right. So that's a great question. It's a little so. She, as she struggled to sort of gain the support she needed to run for speaker again, um, she agreed to step down after one term unless two thirds of the Democratic caucus agreed to support her. Now, she said that, and because she said that publicly, I expect she will stick to that, but she also said that the Democratic rules would be rewritten to reflect that, and the Democratic rules have actually not been rewritten. So she said that publicly, followed up by, and we'll be rewriting the rules for not just me, but for all of the top party leaders, we'll need a two-thirds vote to continue. The rules haven't been rewritten, but because she said it publicly, I expect that if she doesn't get support from two-thirds, she would step down. Thank you, but there's no definition of that. No. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question is about something that you mentioned earlier, that there was this big spike in women running for office in 92. Obviously, the Anita Hill in 91 helped uh, make that happen. And then we saw in response to 2016, President Trump getting elected, um, that a lot of more women ran. Now, with things going on with Brett Kavanaugh um, and new things hopping up just the other day, um, do you think that will have the same kind of effect on the 2020 election? Or do you think because it happened like so close to the midterms that that effect will kind of wear off? All right, great question. So in 1992, there was enough time between the 1991 hearings, Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas hearings, to really galvanize this record number of women at the time to run. And it was disproportionately Democratic. It was also a good um, year for Democrats uh, in a presidential cycle. Although interestingly, the women who did win in 1992 tended to be those women who had previous electoral experience experience, but could just frame their message, like Patty Murray running as a mom in tennis shoes. She was also Speaker of the Washington State House, but that was sort of downplayed. But definitely there was enough time to galvanize women to run and for women to sort of take the steps they needed and run successfully in and, and many places. With the Kavanaugh hearings, as you know, that was obviously right before the midterm. And so no one knew, primaries were over, no one knew was emerging then, but it was really the 2016 election that really galvanized so many women, a record number of women early on. I think the current Kavanaugh controversy is so embedded with so many other controversies going on right now that you know, women in both parties are registering to run for 2020. Um, but I think 2020 will, because it's a presidential election year, because it will be a highly competitive presidential election year, I think just it's a lot of candidates are galvanized by a lot of different issues. Um, and so it won't have quite the same effect as say a midterm would. One more that I'm going to call on myself. Head it over. Thanks so much. This was really interesting and gave me at least a lot to think about. I'm sort of wondering how you disaggregate the factor of gender and race, because it seemed to me in a lot of cases that race was actually also a very significant factor, especially when you were talking about women voters. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess in in what you're seeing in Congress, is, is that a factor? How do you kind of account for that or how is it playing in? It's a great question. Thank you. It's definitely a factor. And we see it, and I think, you know, and, and it's been a factor for a long time, um, but it's been a factor that actually is a leader. Pelosi was very effective in navigating, I think, up until now. So when she was speaker a decade ago, um, she would never appear without sort of a group of members that included a racially diverse group of members. And so she really made sure that someone from the Congressional Black Caucus and someone from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and the Asian Pacific Caucus, you know, were both part of her team in the decision-making process and then very much part of the unveiling and of, of any policy agenda. And she also was very careful about ensuring good committee representation for members of color and really very attentive to that. And 
it's not that she has lost sort of her interest and knowledge, both sort of her commitment and her political insight on this. I think it has just been more challenging for her in this Congress than she anticipated. Um, and in particular with the popularity of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, who has her own sort of fan base, and then sort of from a different perspective, Representative Ilhan Omar, who you know, has said some things that are really problematic for the Democratic Party. And so Pelosi has been, you know, sort of navigating, you know, her new members, her new members of color, you know, Ilhan Omar's historic status um, is one of the first two Muslim women, the first in a headscarf, with some things that she felt as the Democratic leader, she really needed to criticize and criticize quite harshly. Um, and so I think that has been more of a challenge for her that she has not navigated as skillfully as she could have. All right, so one, and my question is this. So the numbers on Republicans in Congress have remained really, really stable. Uh, so my question is, if you were advising the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, what would you tell them to do? That's not what they're called. What would you tell them to do? Like, how can Republicans elect more women to Congress? Well, first of all, women have to run in the Republican Party. And so, I mean, I would encourage the NRCC to contact Republican women state legislators in every district where there is an open seat and in every district where there is, <coughs> excuse me, a Democrat who is slightly vulnerable. And so I think, you know, recruiting women who, who have already run for office and are already serving is sort of, for those key seats is sort of the first step because trying to recruit Republican women to run in Democratic safe seats isn't going to do any good. But looking at those opportunities and then looking to state legislatures, which is where women are, <coughs> excuse me, most likely to come from. But in many cases, there won't be Republican women there either. And so going to the Republican you know, Chamber of Commerce, business community, but then also party activist groups. Um, and then, and this is where parties don't like to get involved, so I don't know that the NRCC would do this because neither campaign committee likes to do this, is to really take sides in primaries because that's the other key for Republican women. Because even though the data show that of the actual primaries that happen, Republican women are no, well, 2018, they were less likely to win primaries. But in other elections until then, there are no statistically significant differences. But nonetheless, experimental evidence still makes it pretty clear that it's harder for Republican women to win primaries because even if they are conservative, those gender stereotypes of women being more liberal make that an extra barrier. So, you know, recruiting women from party organizations and, and sort of chamber of commerce type groups um, and make it clear that, you know, they've got the Republican credentials. I appreciate your presentation today. Um, I have like a two part question. You say that uh, Nancy Pelosi is one of the strongest speakers in history. Is that based on legislation passed or challenges she faces? And then the second part would be what other speakers in our history have been what you would consider strong? So that is based on, in part, the party unity that she was able to achieve. So getting Democrats to vote in favor of controversial, big ticket party priorities. So, you know, now. Obviously, things have changed a lot since he was speaker. Denny Hastert is another, you know, very powerful speaker in the sense that his leadership set the agenda. You know, it wasn't really the committees. It was the party leaders who set the agenda, brought the bills to the Rules Committee, and he was able to get Republican majorities to pass big-ticket Republican items and work with President Bush. So Pelosi was a, I mean, she was a strong speaker in both Congresses, but particularly working with President Obama in the same way that Hastert was working with President Bush. Because when you have a, a speaker and a president of the same party, there's sort of this idea that, oh, they're going to pass all this legislation. It's going to be so easy. But historically, actually, it really is not. And so the fact that you know both Pelosi and Hastert were so effective at doing that and keeping their party together, um, and they controlled so many of the decisions. So prior to that, probably the next strongest speaker was Speaker Joe Cannon. Um, back at the turn of the century, and he was actually took control over so many things that there was a revolt against Speaker Cannon, and he was ultimately deposed. But he made all the decisions about who served on the Rules Committee and, and legislation in the same way that that really you know the parties have power today. Because speakers, you know, in the Sam Rayburn era, despite you know 
sort of a nostalgia for speakers like Rayburn. Rayburn was not very powerful at all because of a conservative coalition of Democrats and Republicans who blocked a lot of his policy initiatives. How would you rate Newt Gingrich? Newt, I mean, he was a... He has a very mixed record. So in some ways, he was incredibly effective. Um, if we're crediting in part Newt Gingrich with Republicans gaining 40 seats uh, in, um, sorry, more than that, in, 1994, in 1994 to win control of the House for the first time in 40 years. I mean, he was the architect of the contract for America. Now, President Clinton was very unpopular. That also helped a lot. Um, but, you know, Newt Gingrich, in terms of amassing power, was incredibly strong. He said, we're not going to do things the way Democrats do. I'm going to appoint all the committee chairs myself. I'm going to give them six-year term limits. The bills, I'm going to create task forces when committees don't do what I want them to do. And so in his first term, I would put Gingrich right up there. In his second term, everything fell apart, and he ultimately you know, had to resign. So mixed legacy. I'm wondering if um, you've if you've looked at organizations like Emily's List or now we have Supermajority, obviously Cecile Richards has been really involved in that. It seems like um, Republicans don't have analogous organizations that are specifically focused on encouraging women to run in the party, but perhaps I'm mistaken about that. Obviously, some of these organizations are newer, so we haven't really seen if they have any um, effect, but I'm sort of curious about the relationship of, um, yeah, either 501c4s or other advocacy organizations to encouraging women to run and whether that has any effect. And then I also have a sort of um, broader theoretical question. So some of the um, observations that you began with, like women in Congress have to work harder <laughs> and so forth, it's kind of like, well, yeah, like this, we see this among women, I don't know, is this still working, um, among women in most professions. And so I'm wondering what the um, particular impact of Congress is. Like, is there something about women in Congress that we should be, um, that's unexpected or that we should, that kind of cuts against the broader narrative about what it means to be a woman in a traditionally male-dominated space? Mm -hmm. Great questions, and I'll take the second part first, and that is yes and no. At some level, it's quite consistent with the story of women in top positions with a lot of scrutiny and male-dominated institutions. Um, but I think both being needed to get elected and re-elected by constituents and then prove oneself to one's colleagues in this very sort of strict institutional structure um, makes it a little bit different, but in general, I would actually say it's quite consistent. I think what until recently was sort of novel is that congressional scholars really didn't, weren't sort of attuned to these things, right? It's studies in other disciplines that are sort of uncovering these results. And so, you know, part of it was bringing this to Congress, but I do think sort of the constituent and institutional imperative um, dynamic is, is somewhat different. And to your first question, I mean, this is not what I study in terms of women's groups, but sort of, you know, if I think about the literature and, and the story of 2019, women's groups absolutely make a difference, both at the national level, but then if you think about women's groups across the country that are really starting to get women in the pipeline. Um, so, you know, whether it's local office, state legislature, school board, city council, and the, and that the fact that women are more likely to follow a pipeline path than men also speaks to the importance. I mean, one of the things that you know scholars have found and you can sort of see uh, more anecdotally is just also how hard it is for bipartisan groups to survive bipartisan women's groups so bipartisan women's groups either sort of stop being bipartisan or have just had a really hard time sort of continuing to raise money um, in the way that an Emily's list have. There are Republican groups, but they're not as big or as major of players as Emily's list is and em yeah and wish list and, and then Republicans, you know, there's the pro-life group and the pro-choice group, whereas Democrats just have one group. Um, and so that I think matters as well. Emily's list for a long time was so concerned about viability that women who wanted to enter politics would complain that they weren't supported because they weren't viable enough when Emily's supposed to be list is supposed to be early money. But now they've sort of branched out a little bit and then with more groups, um, I think that matters as well. <laughs> 
I just have a question on whether or not you kind of mentioned it when you were talking about coding for women's interests versus women's like issues, I guess. Um, do you see kind of a partisan shift in terms of Democrats talking more about quote unquote women's issues versus Republican women also doing that or perhaps focusing more on women's perspectives on more universal issues? So great question. In speeches, in one minute speeches where members of Congress can talk about whatever they want, Republican women were more likely to talk about the impact on women, uh, the impact of war on women. So women in Afghanistan, women in Iraq, women in small business, sort of issues that Republicans in general are more likely to talk about. And Democrats were more likely to talk about sort of domestic social policy and issues that Democrats are more likely to talk about. But interestingly, if you look at debates over key votes, that shifts a little bit. So if you look at, for example, the debate over the rule during the Affordable Care Act debate, which centered on whether or not there was going to be uh, an amendment restricting abortion and the public option, women in both parties were much more likely than men to talk about it. So on the Democratic side, the Democratic women were lined up, and on the Republican side, the Republican women were lined up. So on two different sides of these issues, but the, but the groups that prioritize talking about these issues the most. And thank you for your great questions.